Good morning, church. Great to see you guys. Uh, I know for a lot of people, it's the most wonderful time. Of you. Thank you, Alicia. My one person got that, yep. But for some people, this is not how they feel about this season. It's the most stressful time of the year, or the most broke time of the year. Or maybe it's a time that reminds you of loss. Maybe this season rolls around and every year it takes you back to something that was a tough time. Or maybe, like millions of people, it's that seasonal depression that comes in. And who can blame you when it gets dark at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Or they go, hello, darkness, my old friend. Why are you here? It's 5 p.m. This is so true. And it plays with your mind, right? So one of you sent me this this week. It says, November doesn't have afternoons. It's just morning until 2 and then night. Have you noticed that? Man, I'm yawning at 4. It was 6 o'clock. We're like talking to people. My family's here. I'm like, hey, is this, y'all got your clothes picked out? We need to be in bed. I'm like, the Bama game hadn't even started yet, which, uh, don't get me started. You saw that one. I tell you what, y'all not praying for me. In fact, I think, Elliot, I think you're praying against me, actually, about this. This is 100%. <clears throat> Sometimes this is a tough time of year, and uh, chronic depression is no joke. And I want to I wanna kind of explore this. I, I read an article just this week about a woman who was struggling with chronic depression. And for years, she battled negative thoughts, always seeing the worst in every situation. You ever felt like that? You ever known somebody like that? And uh, her relationships began to suffer. And then her work performance started to decline. She found herself in this downward spiral of negativity. And eventually, it got so bad that she actually sought the help of a professional counselor. It was a secular therapist, okay, so not a pastor, not Christian counseling. Remember that, okay, because that makes this even more profound. A secular uh, therapist, and she met with this doctor, and he gives her an assignment at the end of their first session together. He says, I need you to do something. And the assignment seems so simple, but check out what happened. On the advice of her therapist, before she went to bed, she had to complete this simple practice. Every night before turning in, she had to write down at least three things she was grateful for. Three things. And we think, well, I mean, how hard could that be? Well, if you've ever been in a downward spiral, if you've ever been in that depressed funk, it's no joke. And she struggled. In fact, she said at first it was such a struggle. Some days the only thing I could write down was, I guess I'm grateful I got out of bed. <laughs> you ever felt like that? And then finally she was able to add, you know what, I'm thankful that I had decent food to eat today. And then her list started to grow. And as the days went by, she began to notice something changing. And she began to find herself looking for things to be grateful for throughout her day. And so she started to notice these small blessings all over that she had overlooked. Gradually, she noticed her outlook began to shift. And that cloud of depression that just hugged her so tight began to lose its grip and began to, to lift and she noticed that her relationships began to improve because she was focusing more on what she appreciated about the people she was interacting with that previously annoyed her. Her work performance began to increase because she found now reasons to be thankful that she even had a job. And then it finally hit her. Check this out. This is so good. I love this last quote. She discovered this. She said, gratitude was more than just a feel-good exercise. It turned out to be a powerful tool that transformed my life. Guys, that's a biblical truth. Did you know that? That is a biblical truth. But instead of uh, preaching just another typical, as expected Thanksgiving message on gratitude, I thought I'd do something different, something I've never done before, and something I don't think we hear much, but I want to look at this from a totally different angle. In fact, it might surprise you, but this is kind of our overall arching theme. And if you're taking notes, this is, this is where we're going to land. Gratitude is actually a form of spiritual warfare. Let that sink in for a second. Gratitude is actually a form of spiritual warfare. When we think about spiritual warfare, I don't think we think of gratitude. We think about big Michael and Gabriel and the swords drawn and angels and fighting and Lucifer and throwing into the abyss and all these things. But what if I told you that one of the most powerful weapons against darkness is simply an attitude of gratitude for all that God is doing and has done? How would your day be different? 
How would your day be better if we realized that gratitude was actually going into spiritual warfare? If we realize that our mindset is now not just about being thankful for the small things, or whatever, lifting your spirit, but it is actually changing the way we view everything. There is some awesome truth we're going to look at today. Go ahead and open your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. Pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me say hello to our online guest and our out-of-town family. Great to see you guys. If you're a first-time guest here, welcome, or a returning guest. It's so good to have you. My name is Matt Mitchell. I'm the lead pastor here and one of several that you'll have in the pulpit teaching. And I'd love to meet you after church, shake your hand, give you a hug, and uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. All right, everybody got it? Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 15. I'm going to read from the NIV first today. Let's follow along together. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Remember that. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Right? We just did this. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. There's that word again. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. All right, did you catch what we just read there? In these verses, we see that embracing and cultivating gratitude is more than just a nice thought. It's more than just, oh, well, that's kind of nice. It is a powerful spiritual discipline that can combat darkness. Darkness in your mind, darkness in your heart, darkness around you, your perspective. All right, so I want to explore how do we wield this weapon of thankfulness in your everyday life. Look at the very first part of that passage. Notice he says, let the peace of Christ, what's that word? Rule. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, not just be a part of it. Not just if it's nice and you're having a good day and things are going well, that you feel a modicum of peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you're called to peace. And be thankful. We're going to come to that. All right, let's dive deep, okay? The word translated here as rule is actually the Greek word brabueo. This is such a cool word. I, I looked into this this week, and I learned it literally means to act as an umpire or a referee. Meaning, you call balls and strikes. That's out of line. That's out of bounds. This is inbound. This is out of bounds, okay? To act as an umpire. I want you to think about this. We got any Wolfpack fans? Anybody? Four Wolfpack fans? Are you kidding? Are, what, are, do we have any Carolina Tar Heel fans? Four. Wake Forest? Duke? None of the above? Is that it? Okay. All right. Okay. I, I'm learning about this flock here. That's, any Alabama fans? Thank you. Those are these saved people. I know, but if you pray for us, that's, I don't know what happened last night. We're not going to talk about it. Not in the pulpit. There was an umpire that was famous during an NC State game playing against Maryland. I don't know if you remember, but the, the umpire's name was Ron Cherry. And he made one of the most classic calls in a game that was a blowout. But he threw the flag and he said, oh, personal foul. I love this. He was giving him the business. <laughs> it's says... It says, refs don't do that. They're supposed to be impartial. And they don't do that. But when he, when Roger, he was getting, and now this is a meme and it's everywhere. See, he saw something that was out of line and he threw a flag. Guys, do you know what Paul is saying here? He's saying that the peace of God in our hearts is supposed to be so strong. It is literally supposed to be the guardrails as an umpire to where when you see something comes into your mind, the devil whispers a thought, you say, throw in the flag. That's out of line. When a lie comes against what you say, boom. Devil, I rebuke that. That's a falsehood. Why? Because I know scripture. And I know that is a lie from hell. And I'm not going to believe it. And I'm not going to let you rob my peace. In fact, not only am I not going to be defensive, I'm going to go on the offense and I'm going to say, I am grateful. God has done things in my life. Even if he never does another thing, just who he is merits my highest praise. See, that's what Paul's saying. This brabueo, we are literally supposed to have this, this constant acting as an umpire. The peace of God is, is keeping us out of the ditches of depression and dragging us back on it. We're letting the peace of Christ rule our hearts. It's the deciding factor. It's supposed to guide your decisions. It's supposed to guide your attitude today. All right, how are you doing with that this holiday season? <laughs> it just hadn't even started yet, right? People are already crazy. Getting on people's nerves, driving crazy. We'll come to that. 
Notice what he says, though, immediately after this. I love the three words. Oh, and be thankful. What a weird juxtaposition. Paul is connecting the peace of Christ with thankfulness. Be honest. We don't think like that. Nobody caught that in their quiet time, right? He is connecting the peace of Christ with thankfulness. This isn't a coincidence. He's telling us, guys, gratitude plays a huge part in your allowing Christ's peace to rule your life. And that's our first truth for today. If you're taking notes, gratitude will restore my peace. Are you lacking peace in your life? Check your attitude for gratitude. Come back and look at this, right? When we're grateful, we're less likely to be anxious. Anybody want less anxiety? When we're grateful, we're less likely to be fearful. Anyone want less fear? Just turn on the news, man. It's fear-mongering left and right. Anyone want less conflict with others? Gratitude. Think, you know, less anxious, less fearful, less conflict. God, that sounds a lot like peace, doesn't it? So thankfulness leads to peace in our hearts for today. And it helps me maintain a healthy perspective. God, but check this out. It's not just about today. When we remind ourselves of God's faithfulness in the past, it gives us that assurance we can stand on his promises tomorrow. So when God says, I will not leave you nor forsake you, you can believe him because he's been proven true in the past. Does that make sense? When somebody tells you something over and over, and they've always come through, you start to believe them. Their reputation precedes them. You say, I believe him because his word counts. That's how we are with God. Gratitude restores my peace. Here's something else that a lot of people miss. Notice that Paul phrases this as a command. He says, and be thankful. It's not an afterthought. It's not, hey, if it's convenient, if everything's going good, why don't you throw up a little thank you prayer? All right, God, nod to God, tip. He's saying, be thankful. It is, guys, this is telling me that gratitude is not just a feeling when things are going good. Gratitude is not something that we just passively experience. It is a choice that we actively make. And that's our next truth this morning, right? Thankfulness is an act of the will. If we can grasp this, guys, this will set you free. Thankfulness is an act of the will. Did you know that? Like, we have to choose sometimes to be thankful, even when we don't feel like it. You all know how I feel about feelings. Oh, feeling. I mean, it's just, to quote the great rock band Boston, it's more than a feeling, and I said I'm a... Nobody knows those words. Something about Marianne. But it is more than a feeling. Because your feelings, when you wake up, don't always line up with gratitude. The older you get, some of you younglings, you'll get there. Things hurt. Things are popping and cracking and stuff that you didn't even know you had. Right? And it's hard. It's hard. You're, you're limping to the bathroom and you're like, uh, I got to be grateful? Well, yeah. See, it's an act of the will. God has done so much. There are so, a thousand things he's done just by sunrise that we can pause and acknowledge. But I have to condition my mind to be on the offense. It is spiritual warfare. The devil wants to rob me of my peace and of my joy. And I say, no, I am going to take these thoughts captive and thankfulness is an act of the will. This is where it becomes form of spiritual warfare. By choosing thankfulness, I'm actively resisting negativity. You see that? I'm actively resisting fear and discord that the enemy loves to come and sow. We're creating space for the Holy Spirit to allow peace. Right? We just sang for several minutes about the Holy Spirit. Come and rise up. We create that space when we have hearts full of gratitude, where we're thanking God and we're not dwelling on the negative and we're not complaining and we're not these constant victims and whining about stuff. When God has done so much to bless us. Now check out what Paul says next. Paul connects this peace and gratitude to something we don't think about, which is unity in the body of Christ. He says, since as members of one body, that means we're all in this together. You are called to peace. Did you catch that? Ever notice that when we're thankful, we're less likely to grumble and complain in our marriage? Ever notice that when we're thankful and we're expressing gratitude, we're less likely to complain at work about our coworkers? We're less likely to complain about our boss? We're less likely to complain at church? You see what's happening here? We are on the offensive. Paul knows that. It protects the unity. And it fosters this atmosphere of appreciation. Let's be honest. It is hard to be angry with your spouse when you're busy thinking of items you are grateful for. 
It is hard to be in conflict with somebody when I'm actively looking for reasons to thank God for them. Isn't it? All right, keep going. Look at verse 16. Paul writes this. He says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I love that it's talking about this unity and this oneness. I am so grateful for Potter Tan, for the sweet fellowship we have. I meet with pastors all the time. I got introduced at a pastor's lunch, and they called me the Pope of Apex. <laughs> what? I said, oh, yeah, you're, you're the grandpa on the block now, and you pastor the other pastors, because we all come to you with our chins dragging on the ground. You come and encourage. See, gratitude allows us to encourage each other to live in oneness, and, and, and I'm so grateful for what we have here at our church. Notice where the gratitude is grounded in, though, in the word of Christ. Did you catch that? In the gospel. Paul is telling us, let the message dwell among you richly. How are you doing with that? Dwell among you, not just dwell among you casually, not, not once a week. Not get into the word if it's convenient. The word dwell here, break that down. It actually suggests much more than a casual acquaintance or a drive-by, it actually implies making a home and settling in deeply as if you were sitting into your lazy boy recliner, pulling up that little funky kick thing, and you watch your team lose, right? It implies sitting into, settling in, a dwelling on that, right? And that's our next truth. You guys got to grasp, scripture is what restores our gratitude. This is where we find truth. The world was going to tell you lies, and dwelling on Scripture helps restore my gratitude. Right? So if you're taking notes, if gratitude restores my peace, Scripture restores my gratitude. This is what helps me focus. When I immerse myself in God's Word, when you do, it shapes your perspective. It starts to remind me of truth versus lies. It reminds me of God's character. Reminds me of his promises, his faithfulness, and this gives me reasons for gratitude, even when things are awful, even when circumstances are rough. All right, so what does this look like practically in your life? You know, I don't like just head theology. Can't stand this lofty, this ivory tower theology. Here's the Greek, go home. How does this apply to you today? What does it look like to immerse yourself in God's word? Don't complicate this, guys. There's three doable ways. All right, they're not coming on the screen. You're gonna have to take your own notes on this, okay? I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna spoon feed you on this one. The first one, do you have and protect a daily time with the Lord? If not, I highly recommend it. First thing you need to immerse yourself in scripture is to open the book, spend time with the Lord. Have that quiet time, regular Bible. Guys, you know this, you've heard about this since you were knee high to a little frog. This is your time with the Lord. Protect it. Don't let any old thing, don't put the phone down. Don't you doom scroll. This is your time with the Lord, right? You have to protect it because the devil's going to do everything he can to rob you of that time. You know it. You've probably experienced it. How are you doing that? A daily time with the Lord. The second thing, pick a verse and memorize it. Memorize scripture. One a week. One verse a week. It's not too much to ask. Our youth are doing that. Our kid men are doing that. I love it. Sometimes they'll post it and they'll sit there and they'll recite a scripture and it just makes my heart just overflow because they are hiding the word in their heart. And when the devil comes, and he will, and tries to whisper lies, they can say, I, that's not true. Pull this out. Here's truth. But if you don't hide the word in your heart and you don't memorize scripture, you don't know it, you don't know what's true. Because truth is relative to most people. Only to born again people who believe God's word is truth can we say, no, I know the guardrails. Brabueo, right? We look at this. We know what the guardrails are. We can call balls and strikes because we know the truth. A daily time with the Lord. Memorize scripture. I want you to pick a scripture one a week and commit it to memory. And then listen to sermons and podcasts and things that fill you up when you go to bed. All right? This is a new one. This is modern technology. I've learned there's all kinds of things like YouTube channels and stuff. Last night, I did this. I practiced this. I want to practice what I preach. My mind was racing 1,000 miles an hour. I was so mad because of that Alabama game. And my blood pressure was up. Just asked my family. And I'm laying in bed. I'm like, I have got to find peace. I've got to go to sleep. So I pulled up my favorite preacher. Pulled up David Jeremiah. 
And I started listening to stuff, and I felt so, it was like I was giving my mind a shower. I was saturating my mind. He's in this uh, gold, coming golden age. I'm going to take you all through that in the new year. Oh, it's going to be so awesome. You're going to love it. And then I thought, you know what? There's so many great podcasts and YouTube channel. Jason, our tech team, you know, they upload Bill and Jason and Colin and everybody's message, my messages. We've got four or 500 hours of messages online that you can hear. I promise you, if you're having trouble falling asleep, pull up one of my messages. You'll be out in no time, all right? Just listen. But what you're doing is you are letting your mind bathe in life-giving truth. And when you wake up, it's amazing how different you are, you are because you've slept. See, this fuels my gratitude. It equips me for battle. Notice what Paul emphasizes here, though. He's emphasizing the communal aspect. Oh, now it's getting real. He's talking about community, the aspect of scripture-centered thankfulness. He says we're to teach each other, admonish one another. This is hard to do if we're living in isolation. Okay, so if you're wrestling with that seasonal depression, I know I'm talking to somebody, or maybe you're detached. Resist the urge to pull further away during this time. Lean into the places that can help you. Don't run from them. Does that make sense? Lean into the gospel. Lean into this. Paul is saying it is a communal aspect. We cultivate together as the body of Christ. Something happens. It spreads like wildfire. And that's your last truth for today. Gratitude is contagious. Much better than COVID or flu or whatever, hacking, cough things going around this week. Gratitude is contagious. When we express our gratitude to each other, it lifts their spirits, our spirits, all around us, and it creates this group gratitude, this culture of thankfulness, and negativity dies. Paul mentions something very specific here, something we practice every time we gather, singing psalms, hymns, songs in the spirit, spiritual songs to each other. Guys, music has such a unique power to reinforce truth and to stir our hearts. And we gather together, we are so blessed here at Potter's Hand, we get to sing these songs of thanksgiving, we're engaging our whole selves, our mind, body, spirit, and voice. This is an act of gratitude. This is why singing songs is so attacked by Satan. This is why that time, this, by the way, don't show up late. This isn't the pregame before the jumbo jet of God lands during a sermon. This is the game. Come early. Come fight for that front row. Get up close. Minimize the distraction. Have everything. Check the kids in if you need to early. But don't miss. This is the time we, this is the only time we have as a communal group to come and allow these things to stir our minds and to reinforce the truth and to encourage each other. It's so powerful in the spirit realm to resist spiritual attack. In fact, that's if I could give you a bonus one, it's this. Gratitude affects everything. It's all encompassing. All right, look at verse 17. He says, and whatever you do, whether it's in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through God the Father through him, right? Did you catch what Paul did there? He did something very unique, and I have missed it until just this past week. Paul is expanding the scope of our gratitude. And he's saying now gratitude encompasses every aspect. He says, whatever you do. Think about that. This, this means this leaves no area in your life untouched. Gratitude is all-encompassing, and it brings this Christ-centered perspective to every part of your day. Think about this. This challenges us to find reasons to be thankful, even in the daily humdrum and the mundane things and the things we don't like, all right? I'm going to step on some toes here. When you're about to complain because you find the sink full of dirty dishes, and it's time somebody deal with it, and you are the bigger person, and you roll up those sleeves, and you squirt that blue goo into the sink, dawn, whatever it is, right? You can tell I do it a lot. And you can complain, or you can say, God, you know what? I'm thankful that there's food on these plates to even wash off. I'm thankful I even have dishes. God, I'm thankful I enjoyed a meal, mowing the lawn, and out in the heat, sweating, <clears throat> pulling weeds. Thank God you have a yard. Choose to be grateful that you have a, a safe, warm place to sleep that night. You have a messy house? Toys everywhere? Man, thank God for your children. 
It's just a season. Some of y'all know how fast this goes. Some of y'all are nodding. Thank God that you have kids to step on those Legos. <laughs> Call 911. It hurts so bad. Stuck in traffic? Thank God. For, I can't. I can't do it. I can't. I'm trying. Y'all pray for me. You're behind the worst driver in North Carolina. I don't know how he finds me every week. Doesn't use his turn signal. And when he does, he leaves it on for seven miles. Right? Uh, you got to thank God that he is patient with you. And he's not demonstrating the same patience you are to that person. Thank God you have a vehicle. That you have a way to even get to work. See how this gets real? Where the rubber meets the road? This goes right along with Paul's teaching in 1 Thessalonians. Look closely at this. A lot of people misread this. It says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You all look closely because most people misread and misquote this verse. Notice that it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. That is a whole different critter altogether. God is not saying I want you to be thankful. Oh, I'm so grateful for this broken arm and car wreck. Praise the Lord. Woo. He's not saying put on a fake smile and act like that's joyful. He's saying give thanks in all circumstances. Do you see the difference? That means when you are in this circumstance, He's not saying you have to be happy about everything. Giving thanks in all circumstances doesn't mean that. Rather, it means we trust that God is still working in the midst of these difficult situations. And me, as a follower of Christ, I am making the choice to thank him for his promises that are true, that haven't changed because I'm having a bad day. I thank him for his presence. See, this is persistent gratitude, guys. This is why it's a powerful weapon. This is why it's spiritual warfare, because this pushes back against discouragement. I don't get in my own little doom loop and start spiraling worse and worse. Like I say, there are things to be thankful for. This, I'm not going to give in to bitterness and despair. Anyone ever been to L.A.? Yeah? LA. Oh, sorry, not Los Angeles. I'm in Lower Alabama. <laughs> Anybody ever been to Lower Alabama? Okay. If you haven't, whoo, it's God's country, right? It's a little hot. Down in Lower Alabama... There is a monument in the middle of town square. And you would think in Alabama it would be to some famous Alabamian like a president or a war hero or some general or maybe a famous Alabama hero like Booker T. Washington or a George Washington Carver. But nope, it's not. The monument is to the boll weevil. <laughs> Go Alabama. I want you to look at this little nasty critter on the top of the statue. Lady Liberty's holding up a boll weevil. And I learned something this week. See, the town is Enterprise, Alabama. If you've ever been through Enterprise, it's awesome. Don't blink. All three stoplights are still working. And as you come into town, you will see this massive statue there. Their livelihood was based completely on cotton all the way up to the early turn of the century. And then in 1915, the boll weevils showed up and decimated it, destroyed their livelihood. All right, but check this out. Through this struggle... This entire city and enterprise out learned the importance of now having to diversify their farming. So through this situation, they now began to plant peanuts and corn and all kinds of other crops. And within four short years, they e erected a monument to the boll weevil. Why? Because they wanted to serve as a reminder that through terrible circumstances, good things still came their way. And they could indeed give thanks in all circumstances. Did you catch that? What looked like a horror, I mean, losing your livelihood, crops being decimated. When we actively look for reasons to be thankful, church, we are training our minds to focus on God's goodness instead of our problems. Do you see the difference? Guys, this will change so much. You want to know a little bonus secret here? A little blessing I thought of this week? The attitude of gratitude is not only contagious amongst us, it is all-encompassing because the lost people see it. People who don't know Jesus see someone who's grateful. Look around. In a world where people are so negative, 
and so complaining and so quick to fly off the handle and be angry, somebody who comes into your room with a thankful attitude of gratitude and a grateful heart stands out. They stand out so much. Think about it. I, I have a, a doctor. I went to see Dr. Gard, um, and he wasn't there, and there's a new guy. His name's Dr. Evan. And I started talking to this guy, and I just looked at him. After several interactions, I said, there is something different about you. I just appreciate your, your spirit. And he looked at me and he said, it's because you and I are playing on the same team. I guess on his records, it says something that I'm a, a pastor. And he knew that, and he looked, and he kind of winked and like, we're on the same team, brother. And I said, I want you to know something. Your attitude is contagious. And I thank you. Keep up the good work. You know what he did? He stopped his exam. He said, thank you for saying that. It is so rare to hear anybody notice. And in his mind, you know, he's just being a follower of Christ, a disciple. But to have somebody come up and say it, you see the gratitude and the contagiousness of this, right? Like, I know that guy. I don't even know his last name, but I feel like he's a brother. <laughs> like, give me a hug. This is, this is what we're talking about, guys. It stands out. So you know I got to ask, what about you when you go to your family reunion this week? When you walk into the room, are you going to bring stress and more? <laughs> or are you going to be the one who walks in with the peace of Christ and has an attitude of gratitude that is overflowing where people go, mm, man, there's something different about you this year. And then we can point them to the source of our gratitude, our relationship with Christ. 